Great. So good afternoon, everybody. Happy lunch hour. Happy lunch and learn. Um, Tina, everybody can see my screen. Looks good. Yes, it does. Perfect. So um, my name is Victoria Gitanis. I'm so happy to be able to be here with you guys today. I am currently serving as the deputy director of the Florida Department of Education's Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. In my uh, former life, uh, about uh, nine months ago, I served as the state director of special education for the state of Florida. Um, and prior to that, I, I had several other positions, including leading the work in dispute resolution and monitoring for that bureau, leading and directing educator preparation, and then for the bulk of my career, serving as a classroom teacher for students with disabilities, primarily students who were uh, with sensory impairments, who were visually impaired or who were uh, dual sensory impaired. I come to this work with a little bit of a personal mission, a personal story. I think all of us who are here today do that. Uh, I started my life as a general educator and it was uh, upon the birth of our twins um, and they were micro preemies and, and um, all of the, the, the work that went into uh, all the therapies that went, and surgeries that they went through and um, and some of the disabilities from that process that persist with them moved me from being a general educator to a special educator. And then uh, eventually, you know, moving with as they grew, interested me in the work for how we as a state support our, our individuals, uh, both students and adults with disabilities. So, and I know we all come with, with, a, with, a, with our why, right? Our why for the work that we do. And so this is my why, um, and I'm happy to share it with you. So today I'm gonna cover a little bit about VR's history and philosophy, who we help and how we help here at Vocational Rehabilitation, how uh, a person can become a VR customer, and some frequently asked questions that might uh, assist you guys when you, in your work with our shared customers and participants. So VR's history and philosophy here in Florida. So vocational rehabilitation VR is, is not only it's a division, it kind of describes a little bit of a process. And that process enables people who have functional, psychological, developmental, cognitive um, disabilities um, and emotional impairments or health disabilities to co overcome barriers in accessing, maintaining, or returning to employment. And, and that's kind of our overall mission. Our overall mission is to enable and support eligible individuals in finding, getting, keeping, or maintaining or advancing a job. And um, we have, we're both a federal program and a state program. So there are state money and federal money and consequently federal and state regulations that feed into that process and inform that process. So today's vocational rehabilitation program has its origins way back in World War I. Um, when those soldiers returned home with new disabilities and war injuries. The program at that time was so successful that Congress extended it to civilians. So our timeline begins with that extension to civilians that happened in 1920 with the Smith Best Act, uh, which was that first VR program for civilians signed into law by Woodrow Wilson. Um, and then to 1925, where we have the beginning of our Florida VR program. I think our first director was Harold Korpening, Korpening, who served, he was both the director and a VR counselor. Um, and at that time, it was, we, our numbers were just in the thousands. 1973, I think most of us know that's the Rehab Act. And that uh, redefined a lot of the work that vocational rehabilitation does, um, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies 
Um, it actually uh, required programs receiving federal financial assistance and federal employment and employment practices for federal contractors uh, to kind of duly consider individuals with disabilities. And that act was amended in 78. We got 90, in the 90s, we, we began with the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's the comprehensive law that talks about the needs of, of individuals with disabilities. And that act was amended in 2008. It takes us to the end of this small clip of the timeline of this story with the Workforce, Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act in 2014. WIOA, as we, we fondly call it, um, which was a, a reauthorization of the Rehab Act of 73, and that included even more reforms for VR. It's, it's focused really around youth, businesses, and stronger workforce partnerships. WIOA also provides the performance measures for the division. So a lot of the, the data that we report quarterly to the feds came out of that um, of that act in 2014. And you can find the, our kind of comprehensive plan because we uh, uh, asks us to work with businesses and with other agencies to kind of have that comprehensive plan for individuals with disabilities. And that plan is located on our website if you're ever curious and want to look through it. We're working on updates right now. So our philosophy in VR is, is defined in part through uh, those federal regulations that inform the work that we do. And the cornerstone of that uh, is informed choice. And you'll see that little federal re re regulation cited on this slide. That's Title 34 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 361.52. That's informed choice. Um, and it pretty much defines um, where we begin. It underscores the individual value of what work means to a person because it's the customer or participant making educated decisions about their life. Um, in the Rehab Act, it says individuals who are applicants for such programs are eligible to participate in such programs must be active in full partners in the vocational rehabilitation process during assessments and selecting vocational goals, services, and providers. So uh, our counselors are encouraged to always utilize an approach to VR services that provides appropriate options, uh, including counseling and guidance about appropriate options, helping customers to think through the consequences of their choices, and really encourages that personal responsibility. So, um, Like many agencies and that work within a very large state, which Florida is a very large state, uh, we have we are subdivided into areas, and these are the areas. And each area has uh, unit offices that help support the work that we do and interfaces directly with participants. On this slide, you'll see a hyperlink in blue to all of our area offices. Um, in addition to all of our area directors and how you can contact them directly with questions specific to uh, partnerships and uh, increasing communication in the areas of your particular service. Also, we have our ombudsman office, um, which reports up to through our new Bureau of Compliance and Quality Assurance. Um, and the director, that bureau chief is Terry Hoffman. And the director, Wheeler Clemens, uh, he's our lead ombudsman, reports to Chief Hoffman. Uh, and they handle customer concerns and complaints. So these are this is basically your contact slide for who to get in touch with if you need to. All right, so let's talk a little bit about who we who we help at VR and how we help. So VR serves both people with disabilities and businesses in, uh, in Florida who are looking to hire people with disabilities. And we can provide a lot of assistance in the recruiting and hiring and promoting 
and retaining of qualified individuals with disabilities. The key to helping us do this work are our boots on the ground of VR counselors. We are really, really happy to say we are working on um, this big initiative that I know has been um, worked on and begun well before I got here um, that was just passed in this last legislative session to provide uh, pay increases for our boots on the ground VR techs and VR counselors. And, we're happy to say that you know that's going to be soon uh, a reality. We are working on the implementation of that uh, of that initiative as it as it, it did pass and was included in the, the last uh, GAA. And these VR counselors, our boots on the ground, provide customers with information, resources, guidance, counseling. They are highly trained folks. They they help uh, participants learn about their strengths and priorities and abilities and interests. Um, write those individual plans for employment or IPEs and help arrange and for services for VR customers to obtain employment. And those services in a large part are provided through contractual agreement um, with the vocational rehabilitation and individual providers or vendors. You'll see a little picture on the right side. It's one of our VR success stories. Um, that's Mr. William Lockwood and his counselor, Bonnie Burgess, some rock stars. VR also has specialized units that help support the work. We have within, um, within VR, we have units working with pre-employment transition services or pre apps who support general and supported employment services and self-employment and supported employment. A ticket to Work, many of you are familiar with that, uh, led by the marvelous Willette Bowers, that, that work is. Our deaf, hard and hearing and deaf blind services, led by the marvelous Corey. Um, independent living programs and our business relations services. And there's a little link there. Um, and this is just some of our specialized units uh, designed to meet the needs of our participants with disabilities and our business customers. In addition to funding dozens of career exploration camps and job placement programs, VR also funds the following initiatives, Project Search, High School High Tech, which is expanding in the next year, inclusive post-secondary education, and uh, building readiness and construction knowledge, or BRIC. There are many more uh, of these uh, initiatives as well that you can find out about at that link at the bottom of this slide. We also partner, um, you may be well aware and have worked with the ABLE Trust, which is per statute, per Florida statute, a, a, the direct support organization of the Division of Oak Rehab. Uh, Career Source Florida are good partners, uh, Department of Economic Opportunity, my former bureau, the Bureau of Exceptional Ed and Student Services. We work with APD very closely and more closely in the future on, on, on new initiatives, as well as the others on this list. So in order to become a VR customer, it starts with the referral, with the referral process. It, it can, and that can be as simple as you know, reaching out. Uh, referrals can be made by anyone. So if you know somebody or if you, yourself feel like you might benefit from Vogue Rehab, or if you have a family member who you think might benefit from it, you can make a referral. Um, and once that referral for services has been complete, VR contacts the referred individual to discuss orientation and next steps. There's more on that, uh, more information on that process in the link. But really all we need is a name and contact information to get started. Your eligibility for services is determined in part by um, the presence of a physical and a mental disability that results in a significant barrier to employment and a demonstrated need for service to support the finding, getting, keeping, or advancing in a job. You see a real VR client in that picture, Douglas Cordova. So if you are working or um, 
with an individual who receives uh, Social Security Disability Insurance or SSDI or SSI, Supplemental Security Income for their disability, they are presumed eligible for VR services. Um, workplace Incentive and Planning Assistance or WIPA services are available to advise customers on how to work, on how working will affect their SSI or SSDI. And we can support them in that through our counseling efforts as well. Some available VR services include counseling and guidance for careers, training and education after high school, uh, AT, assistive technology, job coaching, job placement, including some of the other categories. All services are, are uh, designed to be tailored to the individual needs of the participant and the employment goals of the participant. Um, that I and IPE is individual and, and all of these are individual determinations. No two cases are alike in this process. This is a, a, a love for those of you who are visual learners and, and like a, a process map. This is a little process map of the VR process that begins at referral and ends at case closure. And of course, it's not a one and done, you know, at case closure if an individual uh, wants to advance in their career or there's a new need determined, they can always come back to VR and we can serve them again. So 11 days from now, our new AWARE case management system goes live. Um, payments are continuing to be processed during this time of transition. Um, and we have some training and support forms available at this link that can be accessed. I know we're also running uh, today, uh, we had earlier in the day uh, vendor and provider training sessions, um, and we're running some next week as well and help sessions uh, to help get folks oriented to the new vendor portal uh, that is associated with the, and, and with the AWARE case management system. Okay, and, and I know I have some FAQs that I put on here before I open it up to some of y'all's questions. So what do VR services cost? This is a very frequent question that we get. Um, we have, a, as part of Florida Rule, which is hyperlinked there at the bottom of that slide for you, we're required to look at the income of eligible individuals to find out uh, what that cost sharing looks like for some VR services. Um, we call this process the financial participation process, and it's one of the things that a VR counselor will discuss and go over with the participant during that intake process. So what can a VR customer do to be successful? Uh, I the suggestions here are really good ones. They're really good for finding and maintaining that, that relationship that ha happens between a VR counselor and a, and a participant or customer. There's an example right there of our VR client, Fania Dietrich, and our new boss. Uh, the first one is stay in contact with your counselor. Uh, reach out with any questions. Be on time for appointments. Follow through with those assignments. And if you have questions, don't be shy about contacting your counselor. Providing requested information, actively participating. Um, in that case, including the creation of the IPE um, and being an active, kind of looking for additional sources of funding, scholarship grants, insurance, and other resources to help support those goals. And then if you guys, if they, if you notice that they have any questions or concerns, there's always reaching up through unit directors, area directors, ombudsman office for more support and making sure these things are happening. That kind of leads into our next slide and next next frequently asked question, which is who can help answer case questions? Of course, you start with your counselor, but if you're not successful with the counselor, you go to your supervisor, the VR counselor supervisor, or the area director. Um, you can always come to ombudsman office, or of course, the, the right to contact the CAF program or the client assistance program is there. If you're a business who can help you with your questions. We have regional, uh, we call them BRRRS, business relation representatives, who are ready to answer questions, led by the fabulous Kathy Davis. 
um, about how to recruit and retain people with disabilities. And they have their own intake email there. So I would highly recommend reaching out to them with any questions that you may have. Another question that we frequently get is about background screening requirements for providers. And this is in part governed by our state law, it's uh, 435.7 of Florida statute. So it requires that some individuals providing direct services to VR customers register with the ACA Care Provider Background Screening Clearinghouse and submit to and pass a level two background screening. So, um, so if you have a person who goes through that process and they don't pass it, you can go through the exemption from disqualification process and all that is outlined at that uh, hyperlink. So about almost half of the participants that we work with in VR currently, based on recent data, are, are, are folks are with disabilities ages 14 through 21 who were served uh, through pre-employment transition services or pre -ex. And there is more information available um, at the following links on this, on this slide. The unique thing, one of the things that WIOA did was uh, allow for folks beginning at age 14 um, to connect with VR for pre ed services. So VR is allowed to work with students and families and schools and community partners to kind of enrich that transition planning and support process for students. Help them gain knowledge and experiences necessary so they can make informed decisions about their future. Um, and and that's really designed in large part to help better prepare them for life after they leave the K-12 environment and to, towards meaningful employment, which is what we're all working for. So there we go. I've wrapped up all of my slides uh, about this process. Are there any questions that I can help you guys with? I am looking in the chat and I don't see any. Um, I am going to just put out there. Does anybody um, have any other questions that you can throw out there to Victoria? I have, I believe I've, un okay, we have one hand raised. Mary. Okay. So. I'm going to see if you can't unmute yourself, Mary. Hey, Dinah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm sorry, I, I was chewing on a granola bar while she was finishing up the slide, so give me no, that's okay. What is your question? Um, I would like her to speak a little bit more on the independent living component. When I called our local voc rehab, they said just getting the job was the independent <laughs> primarily. You know, because I was hoping that could, my daughter and son could have more life enriching possibilities and more socialization because we've been so dang isolated here in Brevard County area. And um, also, if she could talk a little bit about lower functioning persons like my son and daughter have ID. I'm kind of scared, honestly. There's a lot of hype out there and a lot of reality out there about jobs being automated out and AI'd out with a job apocalypse coming. I mean, what's the reality of stability being within the system with these transitions and technology going to be putting so many of the lower level workers out of commission, especially the repetitive jobs. And then people who are in mainstreamed out there are fighting with the regular intelligence group for people who are more and more desperate for employment. Okay, so Victoria, do you want to, I know there were several questions there that Mary asked, do you want to tackle one at a time? Or do you have a comment or information on those? Yeah, so the independent living centers are, um, it's, that's a really interesting question. Um, to give some context that I think might be helpful, and in some states they are associated with folk rehab, and in some states they aren't. They uh, they are governed federally by Health and Human Services, and in Florida they've traditionally 
uh, been seated in VR, and 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 so they are. Uh, but they are kind of they're associated and governed by us, but they're a little bit separate from us as well. So we do have regional independent living centers, and I'm gonna drop a little link that where you can find your local independent living center um, in the message here. But and but I want to also oh go ahead. No, I was going to say, if you email me as well, when I send out your presentation, I will be glad to include all the different links in a follow-up email to sure, all registrants yeah. as well. Thanks, Tina. Um, that's, a, that's a good reminder, and I will be sure to do so. Okay. Um, feel free to prod me, though, if I get... Yes. <laughs> if I get That's squirrels, fine. I know we're a little, we're, we are running hard with our 11 days to the launch for AWARE, but another really good resource that, that, um, that they just had a really, really, really great conference about, um, about post-secondary opportunities for, for folks with, who, who have more significant disabilities is uh, the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities, or the, or, uh, and I'm going to drop their link, the FCSUA. The, they are led by a fantastic group of folks. Um, that should be a hyperlink in there. I know it doesn't it look, doesn't look like one, but it, it is. They have uh, some really wonderful opportunities for what, uh, for kind of tailored post-secondary participation for folks who have significant cognitive disability. Um, and they're a really good resource. Okay. Um, so those are two really good resources for you. Um, one of the things that I think we're, ne we're not, you know, that no matter how automated we get, we, we are still finding success in, in providing opportunities for supported employment for folks with significant co cognitive disabilities. Those are, of course, that those are individual determinations. You know, that's not uh, one thing for a whole group of people. It's a determination made individually. But uh, we have the whole gamut of opportunities that we can provide support to, uh, to folks, whether they can need supported employment or they can, you know, function well with competitive integrated employment. Um, and, and, and that discussion is, is a, it's a highly individual one, but um, there, there are opportunities for them. Great. Okay. So I know Rachel has a hand raised, but I wanted to real quick um, touch on ask three questions that are in the chat. Um, one is, how does someone on the Medicaid waiver with APD get a job coach with VR services? So if you're looking uh, into, uh, if you're looking into a job coach serv uh, service and that's something that that individual client uh, would like to, to, you know, include on their, in their individual plan for employment, um, well, uh, I think the the Medicaid waiver and APD is separate from the job coach issue. I think that you can, there is, uh, you know, of course, that complicated metric of who's doing what, which agency is doing what for a person. But through VR, if you're talking through a VR counselor and they determine it's the most appropriate thing, then, then they can develop an IPE. It has to be represented on the IPE. And then we get uh, we move through that process for identifying that job coach and, and, and where the and, and where and what the specifics look like. So that is uh, through a conversation with your VR counselor, um, and they have they'll, there'll be some information that they need to get through that process. But that's the best way to to move towards job coach if that's something that that particular participant is interested in. Um, the next thing I saw, I saw a question under Dina about, can you speak about medical and psychological assessments in yes. VR services? So, yeah, so if, so basically understanding that VR is, um, is about finding and maintaining um, and training folks for, for, towards that kind of um, employment goal. If there is an assessment that needs a medical or a psychological assessment needed in support of that, then it's identified through consultation with that counselor, placed on an IPE, and can be paid for through vocational rehabilitation. Um, and more information, of course, is available on our website about that, but also through, con through conversations with your individual counselor. There's going to be a new process for payment for those through the AWARE system as well. Great. Um, Rachel, did you want to go over your question? 
where did she go? But I saw her hand raised. Rachel, are you still there? Okay, so while we're waiting for Rachel, because I think she is unmuted, there was a couple other questions in the chat, Victoria. Um, okay. One was a reasonable timeline on what to expect after the form is submitted. So here's my suggestion about that. It's, um, if you have submitted uh, a form and, and you have not heard back in 48 hours, I would definitely recommend reaching back out to that office, calling the office uh, to make sure that they receive the form. Because of course we know um, to make, and, and uh, because they should be reaching out to you relatively soon after that, that form is received. And, and we do have some turnover, although we hope to, that the pay raises that we're gonna be able to offer those counselors and we have techs will, will help that process, but um, we'll make sure that it got to the right person and that person was still there and um and that they they have you as a as a participant who is wanting more information and i'm sure you know that 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 following up on that one is highly recommended for that um okay but, um, let's see another question is for vr clients who have gone through the pre-ets program in high school and have either graduated or reached the age of 22 are they required to start the process all over with voc rehab in terms of intake and other paperwork? So that's a very um, interesting question, and I'm going to say it depends. The and unique thing about pre-ETS is that we can serve both potentially eligible and eligible folks ages 14 through 21. So it. So when they take somebody who has been in a pre ETS program, they do have to go through the process because for folks who are 22 and above, we don't have that potentially eligible category anymore. So they do have to go through that process to determine eligibility. Um, but it can be shorter depending on the individual. That process can be shorter or longer depending on the individual uh, person and, and, and their individual status. Right. Um, another question, is it a requirement for someone to be a citizen or resident to receive VR services? So um, we sometimes do uh, cooperative vocational rehabilitation services between states. Um, for instance, we have an uh, individual with a complex physical disability who recently got into UF law school, and, but he's, an, uh, he's a New Yorker. So we're working with New York to support him to come and attend law school here in, in Florida. So sometimes we work, um, so he's not a resident of Florida, but we're working and dividing the costs between New York and us for this for this person. And that's not a unique situation. Um, I, I'll have to check back about the citizen thing, I'm not sure. Okay. Do we have any other questions um, for Victoria, any comments? Okay, there's Rachel. Okay, Rachel. You are should be unmuted. Okay, well, you're unmuted on my end, Rachel. Um, Reed has a question. And I'm... Uh -huh. um, there you go. Good okay. afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining. Sure. Thank you, Deputy Director, for being here. Um, I've got a question about a recent addition to APD's scope of services, and that's called Life Skills Development for or Pre-Vocational Services. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with that and if there's kind of a roadmap or a vision that VR sees on how those two programs will work with Priet. So that's a really, um, really interesting question and uh, one that we've been talking about uh, kind of offline to, to develop a roadmap you know, between us and other agencies and, and, and groups working with regard to Priet. So I will say 
we are uh, we are working to create a unified map uh, with that currently, and that's that's something that uh, I look forward to. That particular work with pre-eds and pre-vocational skills is something that is of particular interest to me. So I can't wait to see where we go with that. Great, thanks, Victoria. 